Welcome to the Bailiwick Express podcast. This is The Interview, one in a series of podcasts where we at the Bailiwick Express speak to members of our community about events, personal stories, politics, current events or charitable initiatives. Thank you for joining us. For many parents, the birth of a child is a magical, miraculous occasion, which is memorable for what went right. There are many cases, though, where the parents can be left traumatised over what happens for multiple reasons. And those reasons aren't always clear. Former midwife Laura Spence is Guernsey's first birth trauma support coordinator. She can help those affected navigate their feelings. Alongside her work at Bright Beginnings, Laura's also now working with the Prio Premature Baby Foundation as it comes into contact with many people at risk of experiencing birth trauma. But Laura says the reasons for the birth trauma are not always that clear. I very clearly was offered a position at Bright Beginnings Universal Children's Centre yeah. to, um, I mean, they already offer a fabulous range of um, support services for parents and families from conception right the way through till yeah. the child will start um, school. And sort of within that, there's a real focus on mental health for both parents um, and a focus on child development and establishing really strong parent-infant bonds is a really good foundation. They are, I would say, we're becoming more and more aware of the impact of the birthing experience and the lasting effects that that can have on people. Um, It is rapidly making its way up the political agenda in the UK. Um, Quite recently, there's been a public inquiry um, by the UK government Mm. around why people are experiencing such traumatic events during birth. And actually, when when we when we talk about birth trauma, it kind of the title of birth trauma kind of leads you to believe that it might have been, you know, something physical that happened during birth. Mm. But actually, it covers a whole range of things. It, um, you know, it can be something that precedes your pregnancy, like um, if you've had a, um, a loss at an early stage, um, if you've had to have a termination for. Um, whatever reason that might have been. Um, reproductive grief in terms of if you're requiring you know, assistance to get pregnant in the first yeah. place. Um, and then once you are pregnant, things like high premises, so extreme pregnancy sickness. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's huge things that can impact that you, that you bring with you into pregnancy. Um, and essentially my job at Bright Beginnings was to... Um, thread the theme of birth trauma and raise awareness of you know the sort of prevalence of it and make sure that we're catering to the needs of those parents um, yeah. across a whole range of things. And as you said, birth trauma can be something that could far precede this pregnancy and this labour and birth. Precisely. I'm guessing it also go on for a long time after. Oh, Just because you give yeah. birth and you have hopefully have the baby in your arms afterwards um that doesn't mean the end of the trauma i'm guessing no absolutely and and the thing is you know we we need to be considering the trauma that people have had across the course of their life because obviously mm. um, looking at adverse childhood experiences is a massive thing um that can you know there are certain risks or certain things that have happened to people throughout the course of their lives before they get to the point yeah of conception and then journeying into parenthood that they're bringing with them and many of those things make them a little bit more vulnerable to sort of poor mental health during um, pregnancy and subsequently child birthing and it might be particularly triggering for some people you know going Mm. through various things there's you know there's it's there's a wealth of risk factors um, and I think historically lots of women in particular have by default of the society that we live in been forced into this narrative of that's just what happens in childbirth you know put on your big girl pants and get over it you've got a a healthy baby and that's it you should be grateful for that 
and then we don't just, it's mm. unspoken don't it anymore, no. um, and actually that that very much shouldn't be the narrative anymore mm. it's you know we we care about the things that have happened to you in your life and if we want to be um, improving mental health outcomes child development mm. and just general well-being of people um we need to be more considerate around those narratives and validate the experiences yeah. that people are having. You reference their healthy babies, and actually, I may have naively thought birth trauma is around where the baby isn't healthy, either sure. a stillbirth or yeah. another um, fatal situation, or a premature baby, or a baby who, for whatever reason, needs uh, neonatal care. I think it's the phrase. Um, but actually, you said they're healthy babies. And yeah. actually, we do think, don't we? If yeah. you've got a healthy baby, that's that's the goal, isn't yes, it? Yes, yeah. But there can still be trauma attached, even if the baby Absolutely, is absolutely perfectly 100%. healthy. And and I think that's you know that surprises people mm. sometimes, and probably feeds into that that narrative again around yeah. oh, you know your own internal narrative that you're having those conversations with yourself. I should mm. be grateful. For, mm. that I've got a healthy baby, so why do I feel like this? Yeah. But, you know, a lot of us do, and you might experience, you know, for um, historically me as a midwife, I might have looked at someone's notes and thought, oh, that just all seems very straightforward to me. But it's all about how it's perceived and, mm. and how mm. they've felt in that situation, what the communication was like, you know, what were the circumstances round about yeah. that buff? How did they internally feel? Because even though you know, on the whole, they might feel that it was a really positive experience. If they felt scared, out of control, if they felt as if they were going to die, any of those things can um, sort of just play into it and leave some lasting trauma. Um, And, and, you know, you don't always necessarily recognise it at the time because you're very kind of task-focused. You Mm. are living feed-to-feed, nap-to-nap, changing the nappies, you're one foot in front of the other, just trying to get yourself through those very challenging early days. But the fact of the matter is, at some point it might, you know, and that might be in a year's time, two years' time. Mm. It might be the reason that some people put off having more children. Yeah. Um, It might be not until they then become pregnant again that they realise, oh my God, I feel a sense of dread at the thought of having to go through that again. Um, yeah. And there's there's no, you know, there's, I don't want this to come across as the fault of anybody. It's just by nature of mm. the beast, if you like. It, it's sometimes completely unavoidable um, because it's about how we feel, you know, it's how the lasting feelings that you're taking with you. Um, and of course, as I said before, there are certain risk factors, for example, um, someone who may have been struggling with their mental health previously and then obviously goes on Mm. to have children it may make them um, more at risk of suffering symptoms of um kind of i suppose ptsd is yeah um, yeah not everybody will go on to have a it's only a small percentage of people that could be clinically diagnosed with um, ptsd but certainly you can experience a lot of the symptoms without meeting the threshold for a formal diagnosis. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess a lot of um, the work that we're doing at the minute in Bright Beginnings is around um, getting rid of that stigma that um, you... It's okay to talk about it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And it's and it's normal, you know, not... Yeah. It's hard work having yeah. children, yeah. especially when there are things that have happened to you in your life that are compromising mm. how, how you feel about yourself and how yeah. you perceive the world around about you. Is but, any data collated on birth trauma? Do we yes. know how how many mothers, and you mentioned both parents earlier. Oh yes, yeah. yeah I was or say how many that. parents and families actually are affected by birth trauma? If we think about it in terms of um, mental health, I think the statistic is um, one in four mothers um, and by the the data that has been collected for fathers, one in 10. However, that statistic is probably far more. That's just the fathers that have spoken about it. And so we yeah. know that historically men, you know, don't favor speaking so openly about their mental health. Um, there is some research around 
the the rate of suicide in males, for example, um, suicide is the leading cause of death for males under the age of fifty. Yeah. And during that perinatal period, they're forty seven times more likely, um, you know, to be having those suicidal Why? ideations. Wow. Um, and you know, obviously, the the statistics for mum we know from the um, the most recent Embrace report, which is um, kind of data that's collected um, across a period of three years at any one you know into one report around why mothers are dying in childbirth, mm. um, and f- for the second time in a row, so over the course of six years, then that covers. Um, suicide is the leading cause of death in mothers within the first, you know, that postnatal, from six weeks to 12 months postnatally. Um, It's a frightening statistic. Mm. Um, And while (laughs) essentially it's not massive numbers that you're dealing with, Mm. but very, very important risk factor that needs to be identified and managed, um, you know, we need to be raising the profile and talking about it. And I don't think you can talk about mum's mental health in isolation because, um, you know, it's a family unit, so there should be no yeah. mum without dad. Yeah. Um, in terms of dads, they are more likely to be experiencing, you know, they can experience postnatal depression the same way that mum can. They also, and it's not very well known, um, but they also have a sh- huge shift in their hormones once the baby's born. Yeah. Um, they see a drop in... Um, you know, mainly the testosterone, and I think in terms of evolution, um, that is so that they are kind of remain in and around the family rather than kind of go out and so in their wild oats <laughs> or whatever. They yes. kind of focus yeah. it all in terms of bonding yeah. and stuff. Um, but certainly, where there are maternal mental health concerns, you're more likely to find then that there's a concern with dad. But we don't really ever ask, "How are you, dad?" They don't. Yeah. I can see that. And we usually speak to a lot of dads more than you the mums yes. when yeah. they call for the prem babies. It's usually the father that needs to find the place to stay. And yeah, they tend to get forgotten. I know but that, that that's additional pressure then on the dad um, or the co-parent, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Um, which only must only add to any mental health difficulties they may be experiencing, yeah. possibly without even realising that yeah. that's, yeah, that's exactly. what they're experiencing. Um but definitely in the situation of the families that the Prio Premature Baby Foundation helps, Joe, um, you guys must see um, cases where it's quite clear that there's been some trauma. I'll definitely involved. see a lot of trauma. Um, and like you say, the ones in the flat that have been there a while, they're, mm. you know, they're finding it hard being away from home and they might have other children that aren't with them. It, it can get, uh, and in some point they can get really upset. Uh, I've just had one recently. They've had to be moved from the flat because Southampton were too busy. Mm. They had to go to Salisbury. They're all oh, upheaval. Okay. They've got another child. Mm. So, yeah, it was a bit upsetting, but everything's yeah. been calmed down. But those things don't go away. Um, and like you say, they they yeah. leave a lasting effect. Absolutely. You know, you've had to move and you've got a little baby going to another hospital. So, and that's, you know, it's managed at the time for what it needs to yeah. be. But, you know, I think we probably don't appreciate the gravity of that long-term impact, no. do we? Mm. Um, there's probably not enough um, done around it but I think exactly. this will be quite a strong collaboration in yeah terms I'm of so pleased yeah. that we can work together on this because we need, a lot of people don't like you say don't even come back to me and say it's been really hard but at the time you know it has so it'd be nice to be able to say look Laura can help out if you need anyone to talk to yeah. because I mean even with me and, and Andy it was the same he he really suffered and he still thinks about it a lot today. But and is that when so when Seb was when born? When Seb was born, yeah, the, you pe- you were living in the UK. Living in the UK. By the time Daniela was born, you I'd come were back in, to Guernsey. You were all living in Guernsey, but Andy was away. I remember he was him away, telling yeah. me he missed the birth. But so yeah. He, yeah, but that and it's that again doesn't go away. That's either. two very different yeah. situations. Yeah. In one situation, he was there, able to see it and experience it yeah. firsthand, and then in the other situation, he was removed. That must be difficult in a very different way but equally as challenging yeah it was it was yeah and he, you know he was frightened for me because I wasn't well so yes. he was so far away he was like in, he couldn't he do was, anything he was in Macau which was hours away so yeah. he, you know and that 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 really did stick with him and again they like you say they, they forget that the dads have got a lot to think about yeah um, and and look at how over the course of the last few decades there is this now expectation that men will be present at the birth of their children 
Whereas historically, when it was my yeah. granny that was having yeah. children, yeah. Yeah. men were nowhere to be found in the pub, you know, waiting for the news. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but now we have this expectation that they will be there and they will help, you know, they will be hands on because, mm. you know, it's all about that kind of mental mm. load. We want them to see what women go through mm. in childbirth. But what do we do then? We just say, oh, we're going to expose you to all of this stuff that's potentially traumatising, life changing, that's going to affect your mental health, but we're not going to offer you any support about it. So, yeah. I think sometimes we've gone too far the other way, and I've been very guilty of it myself with my husband. If ever I heard him say something like, oh yeah, you know, that, that when Max was born, that was a really challenging time. And I would say, oh, tell me exactly how challenging that was for you. <laughs> and really minimise how he... Yeah. Yeah. And I recognise that now, you know, the more um, I read around the literature and hear mm. the experiences of yeah. other people. And I have been guilty of saying that, you know, because... Yeah no matter how bad they've had it, we've had it worse. Yeah. And, and no, we... But know. in recognising that then, and as you said, reading around it so much, what support are you able to offer now? So this collaboration and your work with Bright Beginnings. Yes. What what can be done to help, these, help people in these situations? So I think in terms of, first of all, with the collaboration between um, the Pre- Premature Baby Foundation, um, we recognise that there's a mm. niche group of parents there who, yeah. um, you know, they might slip through the gap, would yeah. you agree? Yeah, and you know, sometimes when they go to England, they come back and they're just getting on with their lives and yeah. we might not hear from them again or might not see them again. Sometimes they don't even get to get the baby box because they've just gone off and then they've gone back to their own yeah. house. But now we've stopped that. We're trying to find out who needs a baby box. So mm. we're hoping we're going to put a lot of leaflets in there yeah, with yeah, Laura and contact details, contact yeah, details yeah. of how they can help if they need to talk to somebody. Um, um, and I think it would be, um, mm. I think the goal would be essentially that, um, you know, when you know about them, that you sort of get consent that we can yeah. make contact, even if that's just a remote telephone call, video call, text message, yeah. just a weekly check-in while they're there, just to make sure that they are okay and mm. advise about sort of self-care techniques, but also to let us know when they're coming back because yeah. we can very much then facilitate lots of yeah. different things to support yeah. them with their well-being at Bright Beginnings because there's a wealth of stuff there. You know, there's um, one-to-one counselling support, there's um, trauma coaching, there's the support groups, you know, where you have other mm. mums and dads in that same yeah. or similar situation. Um, and really helping because obviously when you've had a sick child that's been in the neonatal unit for whatever reason, whether that's prematurity or, um, mm. you know, some kind of illness or um, requiring operations, etc. It's very much, um, and I don't know if you agree or disagree, but, you know, a lot of those initial cares are done by the special care staff, the doctors, the nurses, and you're not necessarily that hands-on with your baby because... For one, you, you know, they're probably, you're terrified about infection and bacteria and all mm. those things. And also, they're, they might be in an incubator, they might be needing support with their breathing, they're connected up to lots of um, tubes and equipment and medications um, that, you, you, you know, you don't want to disturb that in any way, shape or form. So you might yourself become a little bit resistant yeah. to even want to attempt to get doing that because, yeah. yeah. And, and obviously then there's that delay. You might not be having the same amount of skin to skin as someone who's been looking after their baby from the minute it was born. Um, and so we can really help to promote that and support the parental yeah. well-being and um, the bond with the baby. Um, yeah, I have known of cases that, you know, the baby's been so tiny, it's taken them months to actually hold the baby. So oh. that bond can take a while if you haven't yeah. actually even held the baby. Um Luckily, I was okay. I remember Danny just gripping my little finger, and that was the end of it. But you know, sometimes you're just whipped away, and you can't yeah. actually. Um, and again, do it must come it. back to, as we said earlier, that then people feel parents must, in some cases, feel like they should feel grateful. Oh, my baby has been in an incubator for, I don't know, a couple of months yeah. maybe. But now I've got my baby. I can hold my baby, and I'm at home with my baby. Everything's fine. I should yeah. be grateful for the situation I'm in now. But that trauma is there, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. And probably, 
you become very hyper vigilant then yeah because the baby's breathing normal yes and, I, and you, yeah. you probably become really tense and anxious around the baby's every movement mm. and you know I that's do that I that's that. normal to yeah, experience that okay. but also you know there's ways that we can facilitate that to be an easier transition yeah um that i think we're missing out on that opportunity to support those parents at the moment um and so yeah i think it, essentially we're really good strong collaboration to yeah. address um an issue that we have here because as we were chatting about down the stairs before we came up um that <clears throat> it's you know it's not just the the parents of the baby that are affected um, you know you might have there are a lot of blended families now so this might be um a new relationship and they've had a baby together but but we can't forget about the existing children from mm, previous relationships yeah. and actually what are the situations around um, the partners, yeah. the ex-partners and the children there. How does that affect it? Um, but also the financial repercussions. Yeah, okay. Because that's if, how that comes if up you a have lot. a partner that's then off-island with a baby, what is the um, paternity leave like in Guernsey? You know, it's not yeah. very generous. Mm. My husband didn't he used two days annual leave I think and then was yeah. back to work on the Monday um, so very quickly you might see that dad or the partner has to come back yeah. to the island to get back to work very oh, yeah. quickly and then is probably using that week's wage mm. to go and visit his yeah. partner and the baby you know it, it has a much wider impact yeah. than we appreciate and obviously that's just kind of from the outside looking in and it probably feels really awful for those families um, at that time, it kind of just throws everything up in the air, doesn't it? For, it does. So the support that's being offered then through Bright Beginnings and now in the collaboration with the PBBF, is this new? Has, has, has anyone done this kind of support over here um, before? So it's new, I think, -ish with you, isn't it? It's, you brought this to the island, so, I'd say. So um, yeah. the um, perinatal mental health support has been um, kind of sat through Bright Beginnings for yeah. um, some time, obviously, since the, I think, seven or eight years yeah. since um, it was initially founded. Um, and Rachel Copeland, the director there, is very passionate about, um, mm. you know, offering support to families. Um, and I guess while I was a, mid a clinical midwife for a long time, I my passion always lay with perinatal mental health okay. through my own lived experiences. Yes. Um, so I have three children. Um, my eldest will soon be 15 and then I have a nine-year-old and a six-year-old. Um, my daughter has some significant learning disabilities, epilepsy, autism, okay. ADHD, a variety of things and she goes to a special needs school. And I on reflection, think that the experiences that I have had throughout healthcare with my daughter, she's had a lot of kind of medical trauma in her okay. life. Um, just, you know, by she doesn't want to do something, but we need to explore yeah. it. And, um, it's that, frightening for her. Yeah, yeah, it's really frightening for her. And, yeah. um, I think then that probably fed into, you know, when I then was having the boys, that I didn't want to leave her with anyone, not even my own mum. So yeah. when I went in to have my son Max, I was in the UK at the time, um, she had had a seizure on, so my son Max was born on Boxing Day, and oh. Jodie had had quite a big seizure on Christmas Day night, oh. after all of the excitement. So we oh. were blue lighted into um, hospital and I actually asked if we could just be discharged because I was quite heavily pregnant and I could feel that there was a shift beginning to happen and I thought, oh, yeah. we need to get home because I don't need to be in labour on the children's ward. I'm sure that's the last thing that they need. <laughs> um, yeah. And a few hours later, then my waters broke and subsequently went into labour. Yeah. Um, but I was very quick to be discharged because I couldn't stay in the hospital. I was desperate to get home to her, yeah. to care for her needs. Yeah. Um, and then I had my son... Lewis in Guernsey and while it was all very straightforward there were some medical complications with myself I had a heart condition okay. um, that I hadn't discovered until you know part way through the pregnancy oh, right. I had gestational diabetes I had my daughter at home I had my two and a half year old at home um, and by this point we're not surrounded by lots of family on an island because we'd moved away from family by then 
so you know, the support network is different That's then. The I thing. don't have my mum around me, I don't have um, sister, aunties, best friends. Yeah. Um, and don't get me wrong, I was well supported by what I would call the family on yeah. Loveridge Ward, all the lovely midwives and friends that I had um, through work, but it was a very fast delivery and I was really traumatised by the end of it. I remember okay. I didn't want to leave the house for at least the first kind of four or five weeks. Okay. Um, my husband didn't have much time off work and that meant obviously I was having to go straight back into uh, school drop off, school pickups. Um, and, and manage that whole load mm. without the, su- the support network that I had with the previous kids. Yeah. But the, you know, the existing issues that my daughter had still remained. Um, yeah, and I, I, I had some significant um, postnatal issues, felt suicidal. Um, but I had therapy for that, talking therapies, and then I was referred into... Um, for some EMDR therapy, which is the kind of gold standard treatment for PTSD. Um, And, you know, that was great and it resolved Mm -hmm. a lot of my issues. Um, But, you know, I could see very clearly how, you know, if this is how I feel as a midwife, within that kind of context of childbirth, you know, from, (laughs) from the other side, how actually that people with more complex lives, more complex issues, more terrifying situations with sick babies, mm. um, really poorly mum, yeah. um, how that must impact yeah. people. Um, so then that's kind of what led me to um, start my extended study, because, you know, I wasn't busy enough, I thought. Like, but you thing. obviously saw that there was <clears> a, a, maybe not a need, um, but you, you, could, you knew from your lived experience... Yeah. that this was an area that you wanted to explore yes, and now yeah. you, you, through that extended period of study you can now help other people yes absolutely yep. so I'll be yeah. due to graduate from that masters towards the end of this year oh right if okay. I've got my finger out and write <laughs> I've been telling myself that the deadline is May it's actually August I wish I hadn't figured that out because yes. for a long time I thought it was May and oh. then I thought I wonder what date it is in May oh it's actually August <laughs> so I giving yourself a couple of yeah, I know I keep, te- I keep telling myself May May make sure it's done for me um, as part of that study, which has been through Sheffield Hallam University, um, the dissertation of um, been able to do some research um, on the executive function experiences of postnatal women with ADHD. Because aside from you know all the things that I've talked about, yeah, um, a big part of why I'm not working clinically anymore is because I had a diagnosis of ADHD okay. um, over a year ago now. Um, and that, for me, answered a lot of outstanding questions throughout my entire existence, really. Yeah, okay. Um, I know a lot of people don't like to talk about labels, but actually it was more than a label for me. It was a lifesaver. Um, because now on reflection, everything makes mm, sense yeah. you know it didn't happen overnight but you gradually kind of process things throughout the course of your life and understand yourself um, much mm, better yeah and it's as if I've just been using the wrong hand book yeah all my life and now I've got the right one it just you know it's opened mm. my mind to so many different things and so that's the thing about um neurodivergent people are probably more vulnerable within Um, maternity services in terms of mental health, physical health Mm. and birth trauma than than we know because Mm. there's not a whole lot of research around it. That's interesting. Um, And in terms of helping people then, so you've got to get your thesis written. Yes! You're graduating (laughs) later this year. Um, You're going to be getting extra busy then because people are going to know about this support services that are available but how are people finding out about it at the moment so you mentioned before leaflets in the baby boxes leaflets and just and I'm sitting guessing up. through the maternity services at the yeah, hospital so, yeah. I mean, so people, people and can bright beginnings yeah of so the people can refer in to bright beginnings it can be a self-referral, self-referral yeah um, it can be through the gp it can be through obviously the um, premature baby foundation it you know, a- anybody at all, you just have to go into the yeah. Bright Beginnings. Um, it's just good it's been spoken about. Website, and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is I think it's the main thing. I was also thinking while I'm sitting here, like the flats in Southampton, I should have your link there because they're the ones that feel alone. For me, mm. they do because they're not here with their families, yeah. like you said. So that would be a good idea to do yeah, that. Yeah, link everybody there. Absolutely. 
because we don't always know who the patients are. We It's usually, like you say, from the neonatal unit straight there. I don't really get to know them unless they text me, which yeah. we try to get get like a bond going, but sometimes they're very private. They could only be there a week and yeah, then yeah. they've gone. Yeah. But you don't know they've been traumatised in that week, you don't know. So. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the thing, you know, when, it's, when you're thinking about in terms of premature birth, um, that comes as a complete shock to oh, the yeah. system. Yeah. <laughs> Physically, so, mentally, no bad emotionally. Pact. You know, you're, yeah. you're just yeah. not expecting it at all and yeah. it might just completely have come out of the blue. Mm. So you have that and then obviously the baby is then probably taken very quickly following delivery into the neonatal unit. So you're kind mm. of left thinking, what? The, Where's my baby? What has just happened to <laughs> yeah. me? Where's yeah. my baby? Yeah. Um, for, for them then to have to be transferred off island because maybe they're... Um, you know, just too young to be mm. cared for in Guernsey. They might need yeah. no more specialist care. Um, and that whole transfer situation is really scary. I mean, it's scary for the staff that, yeah. <laughs> that it, on those little tiny... Um, Air meds. It, stuff, uh, yeah. the, the, the little yeah. um, medivac aeroplanes. That must be scary, that. Um, so it must be terrifying for yeah. you know, the parents and the baby um, to then have to go to a hospital where you, you don't know anyone. Um, and kind of try and settle down in there, yeah, and then yeah. any of the medical complications, you know, just the whole step by step, yeah. it's blow after blow after blow. That um, yeah, you know, absolutely. you just and the frustration it. when they're feeding as well. I always remember we said yes, it was one yeah. millimeter a, an hour. It was like painstaking, you know. Yeah. No, nope, yeah. can't feed him now. It was it was really yeah, hard. Of and, and, then, and of course, people you might have had in all your antenatal planning, you might have had your heart set on breastfeeding. Mm. That didn't happen. And, and exactly, and then and then that's an, another thing because you you just keep thinking, God, but I really wanted to be able to. So you kind of grieve almost yeah. for mm. the because your milk hasn't come in yeah, and everything. And, yeah, yeah. There's a whole host yeah. of complications, isn't there? Um, I'm getting traumatised now thinking about. But well, this is the thing, and <laughs> it's, it's, true, it's long it's lasting. It's isn't there, it? isn't it? It is it's long there. lasting, and it's yeah. yes. those memories, I guess, being sparked by conversations years down the line, yeah. and you then realise, oh, actually, and that's the thing about that trauma, isn't it? That you don't. No, really, you're traumatised until it smacks yeah. you in the face yes. 12 years later in the supermarket and you're left in floods yeah. of tears. So for people who want to reach out at the moment, what's the best way to do that and who should they contact directly? They should come through to you. Um, yes, so um, if you have a look on the Bright Beginnings website, yeah. um, there is a link to a referral form. You just need to fill that form yeah. in. Um, and the team have set up a kind of really... Um, swift, smooth process where one of us will pick up that yeah. email and make. We aim to make contact within forty hours, so that you know there's not massively long waits because when you need help, yeah. you need help. Yeah, yeah. Um, and normally it's taken people a while to ask for it, to recognise that they need it, and it's really difficult to ask for help. So. You don't want to ignore it, do you? Exactly. Yeah. And so um, Teresa. Amy, Lizzie, Faye and I in the office, um, you know, we'll very quickly try and make contact just to make sure that that person is okay. Mm-hmm. Just take a, a very brief history and um, make sure that they're safe and um, we then will take that referral. We have a Monday morning meeting where we have a look at all the referrals that have come in over the previous week and we discuss them and we try and work out who would be the best person to support them going forward. Um, and then that, once that key person, so family wellness practitioners, um, they will be assigned a person yeah. who will then contact and go into things a little bit more detail. Um, and then we'll meet up and explore a sort of bespoke um, support package, if you yeah. like, that. Um, you know, we'll explain all of this, the range of support options that we have and kind of build mm. that around to suit them. And that might just be, you know, a weekly cup of tea and a chat to see how the previous week has been. Um, and, you know, obviously following... Because we have mm. women coming to see us from antenatal, post-birth. Um, we can do, um, like, a birth debrief just to chat yeah. through, you know, how they've been left feeling since they've delivered... Um, and a lot of people have asked, um, do I need to bring my notes for this? And actually, I'm very anti having the notes because the notes are a kind of factual black and white account of a series of events that have happened during 
childbirth from yeah. the healthcare professional's mm-hmm. perspective. What it doesn't give is how the woman and her partner have perceived it. Yeah. And that's completely out with, you know, that's out with the control of um, the healthcare professionals. And it's designed to be sort of emotionless. It needs to be a factual account because it's a legal document. Um, and so I'm only interested to then hear, well, tell me about it. Why? Let me understand why you've been left feeling this way. Like, um, did you feel frightened, etc.? And then we yeah. just try and kind of work through, yeah, um, work through those things. And, and these it. talking therapies are so um, can be so successful, can't they? Oh yeah, they're hugely. so important. And also, though, the I think the value of um, that peer support as well. You know, if, mm. you, if they're coming to support groups, yeah shared experiences to know that you're not alone mm. um, and so a lot of that is facilitated um, particularly by um, Amy, Teresa and Lizzie um, you know they have the mum's comfort zone um, which is just a lovely yeah. group and they eat a cup of tea, a bit of cake and just a really nice kind of guided conversation working on self care um, techniques and stuff um, yeah. we've all now done the um, decider skills training as well so that we can you know, we can look at that um, self-regulation when yep. people are at home and then hopefully be able to teach some of those skills then onto their children as their children grow. Um, so, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's been a really, a really enjoyable job so far. Very grateful to be there. Um, and in terms of fathers... Mental health, you know, they, the fathers are more than welcome to come and access any of the support there. But yeah. I understand that it's a difficult, they're difficult to reach yeah. sometimes because they might not recognise, for one, that they are struggling with their mental health. And number two, they might not want to speak to anybody about it, mm. maybe particularly a woman, I don't know. Um, so, yeah, I think um, we're kind of working on that in the background to see how we can better yeah. support male mental health locally and... Um, Might be worth getting a, a man on board yeah. to help with that. So, um, aside from the birth trauma work, I am collaborating with someone called Mark Williams, who is um, an international father's mental health campaigner. Okay. He um, is Welsh, and he has a very strong lived experience of postnatal depression from his wife, but also from his perspective mm. his son is 20 years old now and his wife experienced some really severe postnatal depression and as a result then he had to take some time off work um following that birth to you know care and support, yeah. support his wife um but detrimental to his own mental health so by the time his wife was beginning to recover his mental health was taken a yeah, bit of a nose down so he's now made it his life's mission to support men in their mental health and you know he's um done a lot of different campaigns one of them being the how are you dad um, campaign and you know he does a lot of work within his own community but also internationally he's done mm. an international keynote speaker he's written lots of books and stuff so um that'd be good to hope, link with hopefully that i can kind of link him in yeah. with the whole kind of networking guernsey and he can yeah. advise us and um support how we approach yeah. fathers mental health going forward because that support network is is there and it's growing yes, and it will only continue yes, to grow really then through this collaboration yeah. and through your work and and through people like mark yes who yeah. you're bringing in as well i've always wanted to with the charity to go that next step so it was really interesting bumping into laura and helping out with the parents because you know it's okay giving a baby box and getting the flats but yeah. there's, there's more there yeah. to it so yeah, yeah, it's been wonderful to, to collab with the bright together. beginnings yeah. And hopefully yeah. it's going to be a success and we can help lots of people. Be a blossoming friendship. You've been listening to a Bailiwick Express podcast. If you like what you heard, please share, like and subscribe so we at Bailiwick can continue to pull apart the stories that affect you, the listener. Thank you for joining us.